Good morning. When I decided to write a sermon about Seinfeld as religious metaphor, I wrestled with the premise of the idea of the show, articulated at the end of season four, a show about nothing. Could a show really be about nothing? I decided to take a closer look, and I found out that yes, it was a show about nothing. So it turned out that this is a sermon about nothing. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that was my sermon on Zen. When I first entered the search process for Unitarian Universalist candidates for settled ministry positions shortly after graduating from Divinity School, I stayed in communication with uh, fellow Andover Newton Theological School graduates, some of whom were seeking positions in churches of other denominations and religious traditions. When I spoke to my friends in the ministry of the churches and the Baptist and UCC traditions, they told me of interviews where they were challenged to provide interpretations of various biblical scenarios syncopes, they're called, in theological circles. When I candidated for the position of the UU Church in Bowling Green, Kentucky, no such questions were posed to me. Instead, at various meetings and at shared restaurant meals, there were references to what I may call the Gospel of Seinfeld. There were also references to the Gospel of Monty Python, but that's a sermon for another day. The banter included such phrases as, not that there's anything wrong with that, and anti-dentite, and close talker, and you're so good looking. I remember thinking, lucky I'm a Seinfeld fan. The next thought was, of course, isn't it odd to have an advantage over other candidates if they are not Seinfeld fans? And the next thought I had was, wait, this is what it means to have a good match with a congregation, to be able to meet on the same plane of interests. If we can talk about Seinfeld and Monty Python and baseball and movies that we like, isn't that a sign of compatibility rather than favorability? It was an interesting series of thoughts. I thought, this is a congregation with an unofficial religion as well as an official one, the religion of Seinfeld affiliation. Fortunately, I was familiar with the concept from Andover Newton where the unofficial religion on the hill was Star Trek. That one I couldn't identify with so much, but I expect I will hear a Star Trek sermon sometime, somewhere. The television show Seinfeld began its nine-year run on NBC in July of 1989, 35 years ago, remarkably. Now might be as good a time as any to take a look at its place in this cultural pantheon and what it, see what it is that pulls together a varying people of varying backgrounds onto the common cultural field of Seinfeldania. This is a show that led the Nielsen ratings in its sixth and ninth seasons and finished among the top two every year from 1994 to 1998. In 2002, Reader's Digest named Seinfeld as the greatest TV program of all time. In 2008, <coughs> excuse me, Entertainment Weekly ranked the show as third in their list of the top 25 shows of the past 25 years behind The Sopranos and The Simpsons. When Jerry Seinfeld announced in 1997 that the show would cease production after the following season, the news made the front page of all the New York dailies, including The New York Times. In preparation for today's sermon, I watched 10 episodes of Seinfeld, over a day and a half. <clears throat> now you might say, what kind of job is this? <laughs> He's getting paid to sit and watch Seinfeld episodes all day? Well, I don't blame you. But there's another side that you might not have considered. I was not confined to a hospital bed. 
and I was not a nursing home patient. And it's inherently unnatural, I think, to sit inside watching sitcom reruns all day. Seems like there's something pathetic about a grown man watching TV all day long. Somewhere I came across a reference to the commandments of Seinfeld. A website called listafterlist.com provides a bunch of them, including thou shalt not double dip. Thou shalt keep greeting cards for a minimum of two days. Thou shalt eat snicker bars with a knife and fork. Thou shalt not wear a dinner club's jacket home. Do you remember any of these episodes? Thou shalt not re-gift or de-gift. Thou shalt not attempt to return to the bookstore a book that one has read while sitting, etc. Well, this is all well and good in terms of getting down to the details of Seinfeld trivia mania, but I'm a little more interested in the broader implications of the behavior of the characters on the show. So I compiled a list of Seinfeld's 10 rules of behavior as distilled by synthesizing the plot events of the series of episodes that I viewed. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. They include, one, avoidance is always the best option. Two, never do what your instincts tell you. This is a quote from George. Three, the highest good is immediate personal satisfaction. Four, honor thy father and mother from a distance. Five, image is everything. Six, Success in relationships depends on your skills in deception. Seven, convenience is everything. Eight, personal convictions are fluid depending on your desires of the moment. Nine, you have nothing to be ashamed of if you don't get caught. 10, you are the center of the universe. At this point, the word cynicism floats to my consciousness. Seinfeld does indeed present a cynical attitude towards getting by in the world, and that seems to be the ultimate goal, getting by with as much ease, as little labor, and as much pleasure as possible. Being cynical in this circumstance means behaving out of selfish motives with the belief that others, too, are behaving out of selfish motives, and so we are justified. In chapter 2, verse 11, season 2, episode 11, the Chinese restaurant, Jerry, Elaine, and George are waiting interminably at, for a table at a Chinese restaurant prior to their plans to see a showing of Plan 9 from Outer Space, purportedly the worst movie ever made. Jerry is looking forward to the sarcastic comments they will make at the theater. <clears throat> George is frustrated that another patron is taking forever to finish his phone call on the only payphone available when George has a very important call to make. Very important to him, so very important, period. The long wait for the phone finally ends. George rushes to the phone, but a woman casually steps in front of him and picks up the receiver. George is furious. I was here before you. I was standing right here. The woman replies, if you were here before me, you'd be holding the phone right now, wouldn't you? George is furious response. You know we're living in a society. You're supposed to consider other people. The irony, of course, is that George would do the exact same thing if he were the woman with no moral compunctions and plenty of self-justification. George rails, I can't believe the way people are. What's the story with humanity? This is one of my favorite moments in the series because it boils down the largest of issues, the whole concept of humanity to the smallest concern of a man in a restaurant with too much time on his hands, obsessed with a phone call to arrange a date, one of the seemingly endless streams of dates with women that never lead anywhere but to the next obsession with the next woman for the shallowest of motives. And yet, is this not a facet of the human condition? 
at least here at the one quarter point of the third millennium for Americans of a certain socioeconomic status? Are we not caught up every day, all of us, with considerations we'd be skeptical of if we were to step back and take a look at the larger picture? The beauty of Seinfeld is that it allows us to look at the triviality of our concerns of our everyday life in a way that is entertaining, not jaundiced. The characters of Jerry Seinfeld, Elaine Bennis, George Costanza, and Cosmo Kramer are self-absorbed twits, as the British might say, but the actors succeed in making them charming enough or comical enough that we can laugh along with them as well as at them. It's a dangerous line in some ways. It allows the viewer to give a pass to behavior that we would find unacceptable, if not abominable, in persons with less surface charm than Elaine and Jerry, and less comic entertainment value than George and Kramer. Personality matters and flattens out the landscape of moral responsibility. Something to be aware of and to watch out for when we too, too easily accept the unacceptable in ourselves or others because there's a cheap trade-off that provides some momentary satisfaction. In chapter three, verse 17, season three, episode 17, the boyfriend, Jerry is stymied because of the manned friendship he is forming with Keith Hernandez, the all-star Yankee first baseman of the time. He doesn't quite know whether to shake hands or to offer an oblique sexual gesture because his own motivations are obscure, even to himself. This, you might think, would lead him to realize that maybe 30 minutes of meditation were called for, or some professional help might be useful, or a call to one's minister, or a wise friend. But instead, Jerry, alone on his island of delusion with his fellow exiles, just wanders over the deserted landscape in search of bon mots, catchy, clever jokes. In the same episode, there is an elaborate description of someone who was spat upon, perhaps by Keith Hernandez, in action, on the field, chasing a fly ball and coming too close to the railing. The question, was it really Keith Hernandez or someone else who did the spitting? Jerry works out a scenario that disproves the Keith Hernandez theory through a complicated series of steps through which the offending liquid item, there's always phrases like liquid item, could not have traveled unless it was a mystery liquid item. As the scenario unfolds, you realize you've heard these phrases in these cadences before, and pretty late in the season, if you're like me, you realize that they've just been running through the mystery bullet objection to a theory concerning the assassination of President Kennedy except Seinfeld would use the term JFK instead of President Kennedy as being catchier, more synthetic, less human. I had to admire the audacity of the scenario and the cleverness of the way it handled this historic event. Except for me, the assassination of the 35th President of the United States is not just a historical event. It was one of the central events in the growing up of many of us here in this room. All of us who were living at the time and at an age when remembering is possible can tell you where we were when we heard the news that the president was shot and when he died. I was being kept after school for some forgotten infraction as a seventh grader at Boston Latin School. One of the other kids in the room had smuggled in a transistor radio and he was listening to it surreptitiously through an earphone. On the way out of the room, at the end of detention, he gave me the shocking news. Here we come to the, a threshold that all of us share and that we call by different names. The terms I use are the sacred and profane. There is nothing sacred about the assassination of President Kennedy. There is something sacred about the shared nature of humanity that we can hold a shared memory as a shared experience. We are there is not a shallow 
television network slogan, but a shared reality. We know together what it means to have hopes publicly shattered, to see the energy of youth blotted away, to experience the slow motion unfolding of the explosion of a skull and the subsequent scrambling of a widow soon to be and the confusion of a ceremonial procession turned into a public horror. We have emotions attached to that experience. They are shared emotions and they are sacred. We are, in those moments, being human together. A snarky series of remarks on a Seinfeld episode cannot stain what is sacred in our memories, but it can make it profane. It can encourage us to erase the horror of our experience and the flattening of the moral landscape. We can be entertained, but we have to be careful that when we are, we do not behave as if life is merely a series of casual and inconsequential moments. Sometimes Seinfeld handles the theme of self-obsession and death with a deft touch. In second season, second episode, called The Pony Remark, Jerry makes an ill-considered statement while at a dinner celebrating the 50th anniversary of someone he thinks, vaguely, is the second cousin of his mother. The woman is an immigrant from Poland. Jerry is making frivolous conversation just to get through what he considers the dreariness of the company. In remarks intended to insult people inconsiderate enough to be wealthy enough to be able to afford ponies, he haphazardly says, I hate anyone who ever had a po pony growing up. To this, the old woman of the celebrating couple, named Manya, said, I had pony, all my friends had pony. All right, that's enough, and storms off. A few days later, Jerry gets word that she's died. And lo and behold, he's in a moral quandary because the funeral conflicts with the final game of the series of Jerry's softball team. Comedy ensues. Jerry's narcissism is played out in high relief, and it's easy enough to mock his decisions and the predicament he gets himself in. One of the most controversial episodes of Seinfeld occurs in season seven, episode 23, in which George, true to his cheapskate nature, purchases wedding invitations with envelopes of such a dubious quality that the glue is actually toxic, at least if you lick too many. Susan, his fiance, licks envelopes until she passes out, and yes, she dies. And yes, George is relieved because despite the fact that he's engaged, he has second thoughts about spending most of his energy, second thoughts about it, and has been spending most of his energy thinking of ways, short of the truth, to get out of his engagement. It strikes me that the intent of the writers as the series pro progressed was to push the envelope, so to speak, to see how far they could go in getting the audience to stay engaged with the characters while making their self-absorbed behavior more and more disturbing to the viewer. There is no doubt in my mind that the extent of the damage, the death of a young woman, pushes the envelope, the toxic envelope, beyond the breaking point. Before the second episode of the finale is over, George is obsessed with trying to get a date with a celebrity, Marissa Tomei. The inconvenience of the impending marriage is behind him. He's on to his next reckless passion. To give this series its due, the writers and producers, Jerry Seinfeld included, were well aware of the knife edge on which they played. Before the last episode aired in 1998, there was a buzz across the nation. How was the series going to end? In Boston, the Globe ran a contest asking readers to suggest an ending. The best 10 were published, and they were wonderful. Lots of imagination, lots of engagement. But the writers were determined to push their point home. These four self-absorbed and even self-obsessed individuals, charming and comic as they were, having soaked up nine years of viewers' identification, affection, and loyalty, 
were put in a position to be as recklessly narcissistic as usual, but for higher stakes. Chapter 9, verse 24, Revelation. The four find themselves in the small town of Latham, Massachusetts, where they are as a result of an airplane crash that occurred as a result of Kramer's Three Stooges-like behavior. Trying to get water out of his ears, he jumps up and down in the NBC private jet they are taking to Paris for one last fling, causing the pilot to lose control. They survive and kill time waiting for another flight. As they wait, they are witness to an overweight man getting carjacked at gunpoint. Instead of helping out, they watch and, predictably, make wisecracks about the man's weight while Kramer captures the crime on his camera recorder. Then they walk away. This time, however, their self-absorption has consequences. This time, their assumption that all actions are more or less meaningless, all results concerning others more or less random, all actions without meaningful consequence come up against a harsher reality. The victim is aware that the crime has been witnessed and that the witnesses are walking away. When he tells the reporting officer, the four are arrested because of the duty to rescue law, also called the Good Samaritan Law, which is in effect in eight states, including Massachusetts. It requires persons observing a crime to rescue others in peril. Finally, consequences. Finally, the application of a moral code that recognizes a common humanity as a higher obligation than convenient self-regard. Part two of the finale, in part two of the finale, various characters from the whole series are brought to the trial to testify as to the character of these four as illustrated by their callous self-absorption in situations known by these individuals. Testifying to the character of these four are the bubble boy, whose fragile support system they recklessly damaged, the elderly woman from whom Jerry stole a loaf of marble rye from the bakery, the virgin Jerry dates in the episode that results in the ubiquitous phrase, the master of my domain, Lola, whose wheelchair was replaced by a faulty one by George and Kramer, the library cop, and others, including Robin, the woman whose child's birthday party is disrupted by a small kitchen fire from which George flees, <coughs> tossing elderly persons and children out of the way. <coughs> Our four friends are convicted and sent to prison where astoundingly, they engage in the same frivolous, inconsequential behavior. Some people never learn. In the end, there is consequence. In the end, there is justice in the moral universe. But it's not very satisfying, is it? We liked these characters, Jerry. Don't we have a right to like the characters in our sitcoms? What's the world coming to when you can't even like the characters that are providing you with entertainment? It's just entertainment, isn't it? I'll conclude by again listing what I've identified as 10 guidelines for living in the world of Seinfeld. And when I've finished, I will ask you to join me in a unison reading of our seven principles as found in our gray hymnal. You might want to get to it now so we won't spend time flipping through. It's uh, not a numbered page, but it's about five sheets in. And it's on the left. The 10 guidelines for living in the world of Seinfeld. Number one, avoidance is always the best first option. Two, never do what your instincts tell you. Three, the highest good is your immediate personal satisfaction. Four, honor thy father and mother, preferably from a distance. Five, image is everything. Six, success in relationships depends on your skills in deception. Seven, convenience is everything. 
Eight, personal convictions are fluid depending on your desires of the moment. Nine, you have nothing to be ashamed of if you don't get caught. Ten, you are the center of the universe. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, convent a covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, acceptance of one another, and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations, a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. Amen. <laughs>